Well, thank you very much. The last speaker will be summing everything up. You'll be glad to hear. You get it all in a nutshell. And it's a name that you'll actually be very familiar with, Ken Hapala. He's the writer that is the week that was. And 5,000 scientists and engineers and policymakers, they get this all over the country constantly in their email. He's the writer. And he's also the executive um, vice president of the group that puts it out. That's the uh, Science and Environment Policy Project, a project of Fred Singer, of course. Uh, Ken is actively participating in uh, le le uh, litigation, <laughs> a hard word there to, to read, <laughs> uh, against the EPA for its erroneous finding that carbon dioxide endangers public health and welfare. He's also a contributor to Heartland's superb NIPCC reports, and he was twice elected president of the Philosophical Society of Washington. Ken has been involved with energy issues since the 1970s, and interestingly, under contract with the Federal Energy Administration, he, administered the, he evaluated the models used to predict that the nation would run out of natural gas by the end of the 20th century. He reported that the models were inadequate and the predictions were wrong. That was his last government contract. <laughs> so I introduce you to Ken Hapala. Hi. The talk is on solar and wind, the past or the future. And for a moment, I'd like to uh, give a little background. Thomas Edison, in between 1880 and 1883, unlocked the miracle of electricity to the world. For the first time, he, uh, the production, distribution, and consumption of electricity was commercialized. A central location was used to produce electricity, a coal plant on Pearl Street in Manhattan. It was distributed through an area, and the consumer could consume it when he wanted by a flick of a switch. In the 1892, Edison's principal uh, assistant, Samuel Insull, became the head of the Chicago Edison Company and made Chicago the city of light. He did so by ever driving down the cost of electricity making it affordable to the general population. This was copied by others as well, and all contributed to a massive population shift from rural areas to urban areas. Once they saw the right light, bright lights of the city, it was tough to get the kids back down on the farm. <laughs> the, it contributed to a major shift from the use of muscle power, including human and animal power, to the uh, use of mechanical power. And it also greatly benefited the health of urban areas. Imagine what it must have been like in the summertime living in a crowded urban area with thousands of horses. There was a reason why people wore boots. <laughs> now, we have from the, I'm gonna concentrate on the wind industry because of time limitations. There's the argument that the wind is an infant industry. We have to subsidize it against its competitors. Let's see if I get this right. Here's a windmill, the Bush, 1888. Wind, uh, it generated electricity. Wind has been generating electricity for a long time. And in many rural areas, farms and uh, ranches used wind-generated electricity for decades. What happened? Consumers recognized there was a better way to get electricity and demanded it. And co-ops, co co uh, cooperatives, were formed to deliver electricity. You had also go the federal government got involved, the Bureau of uh, Land Reclamation, as well as later TBA. All the, were designed to deliver electricity to rural areas. The, uh, and when it came, the farmers and ranchers said, we're doing away with the bush. We don't want that anymore. The uh, consumers want reliability, and they, that is the ability to use electricity when you want to use it. And to recognize how important this is, is imagine what happens in a city when all of a sudden the lights go out. 
and imagine what would happen if they do so randomly every week. You're going to have people get very, very frustrated. The, uh, by the late 1950s, virtually the entire country was electrified. It was on the grid. You had central sources of electrical uh, production that was distributed by the gr uh, grid. This leads to the biggest weakness of electricity. You cannot store it. You cannot store it on a commercial scale. So we've developed some techniques of trying to store it in a, another form. Thus far, the most effective uh, and efficient seems to be what is called pump storage. Build a reservoir high on a mountain, and when you have excess electricity, pump the water up uh, the mountain, and when you need electricity the most, then let it run down uh, the mountain through turbines. The largest facility in the world, from my understanding, is in uh, Bath County, Virginia. The efficiency ranges numbers change, uh, I, well, say 70% plus. And what they do is they buy electricity when it's cheap, and they run the water to generate electricity when electricity is expensive. Denmark, in its windmill uh, fascination, has a different approach. It sells its electricity to Sweden and Norway when it, electricity is cheap, Sweden and Norway stores it as pump storage and then sells it back to Denmark when electricity <laughs> is expensive. That's uh, called uh, sell cheap, buy dear. <laughs> now, because of the lack of storage, and you need mountains and things like that to do it, the production of electricity must be kept to a fairly narrow range on the grid. On the grid. If you have wide variation of electricity, the grid can blow out. You blow your transformers or you trip uh, circuit breakers and you'll have major cascading loss, some, at least sometimes. As a consequence, grid operators have to predict and adjust production to meet the consumption requirements. And normally they do a pretty good job doing so. They shut down plants in the spring and the fall when electric demand is low, and they crank to only to crank them up when electric uh, demand is high in the winter and the summer. Now, in our infinite wisdom, uh, many in Washington want to throw chaos into the equation, and that is wind power. This is the Bonneville, this, I pulled this off the web today, so you know you know I haven't chosen it deliberately. This is from the Bonneville Power Administration, which has the largest hydroelectric capacity in the country, as well as has a, the largest single uh, wind capacity in the country. Uh, this is the load where I'm running my cursor, and that's what it faced in the last seven days. This is what it has in capacity for hydro, and this is what wind is producing. Down to zero some of the time. It has a technical capacity of 40 over 4,000 uh, megawatts. The thing to note here is Bonneville has to buy the wind energy if it's being produced. So it, and even though it's more expensive, and it cannot use the hydro which is going to waste doesn't do its customers any good, but that's what the federal government requires. Now we have another little thing about wind that shows its erratic nature, is this is from the Electrical Reliability Council of Texas, distributes about 85% of the electricity in the state of Texas. As you see here, Tex ERCOT is required to buy wind energy. It's produced in a Plain north, uh, plains of North Texas. The biggest demand or consumption of electricity is in the summertime, in the af uh, afternoon and evenings. ERCOT figures that the most that they, they've negotiated this, 
that the most they could really pay for is 8.7% of the capacity that is nameplate on the wind power because sometimes it only gets 1%. They can't rely it, rely on it. Therefore, wind requires massive backup, in some cases up to 95 to 100% of the nameplate capacity. So when you see all these capacity numbers for wind or solar, they don't mean very much. It's not the same thing as seeing it for nuclear or coal. What's really funny, and I find very strange, is many in Washington who claim to be concerned about the environment demand that we waste our resources on building windmills and solar uh, energy generation facilities when we have to, if we're increasing capacity, we have to build almost the equal amount of backup capacity. That's a waste of resources. Now, why is this happening? Well, excuse me, I'm, I jumped one ahead. The, uh, if we look at it, we, and this is just to summarize, we have a limit to uh, wind and solar. Electricity cannot be stored. Man. Uh, controls conventional power, weather patterns often encompass huge geographic areas, and the amount of electricity going to the system must be balanced out. We can look at four constraints in evaluating energy. The physical, is it there? The technological, we knew that there was oil in shale, but couldn't get it out. It required the technology to extract it. The economics, Substitution, what are the uh, substitute alternatives? And then the political. And here we get into what the political is doing. I'm gonna skip that. We have tremendous subsidies going to certain energy producers, but not who you su uh, suspect. Here we have fossil fuel producers, this is in 2011, got 2.5 billion in uh, subsidies largely what is called a depletion allowance that is not available to major oil companies. By the same token, biofuels got $7 billion in subsidies, and they don't produce very much when it comes to what the oil industry produces or the natural gas industry does. And wind got a combination of $1.4 billion in tax cre uh, credits and then $4 billion in outright funds funding from the Treasury. Renewables get a tremendous amount of subsidies. Large, these are going out. The uh, tax, uh, the, um, excuse me, the program of ca uh, cash payments went out at the end of 2011. The wind subsidy is scheduled to go out at the end of this year. We have a government that is vested in alternative energy. We have 23 agencies, 130 sub-agencies, and nearly 500 programs uh, on renewable energy. This is from the General Accountability Office, as you can see on a date, February 27th. So we have lots of tax subsidies, lots of vested interest. Then what's the cost of all these 700 programs? The federal spending, you can read this, but OMB identified approximately $70 billion to, spent by federal agencies from fiscal year 08 to the end of what will be this uh, fiscal year in uh, September 30th. The large majority has been funded technological development and deployment mostly through the DOE. The total amount that has gone through the DOE in the last four years to September of this year, 31, excuse me, 51 billion, 824 million dollars. That is what is driving the big thrust for alternative energy, particularly solar and wind. You can see the source uh, for this. So what, to sum up, solar and wind are proven to be totally unreliable producers of expensive and produce expensive electricity. They lower the disposable income of the average Americans and reduce their standards of living. 
It is a regressive tax. 29 of the 50 states and many Western European countries require that the consumers buy from these expensive, unreliable producers of electricity. Yet many in Washington and elsewhere claim that this is the path to prosperity. You can figure that one out. Thank you. <laughs>